Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the History of Valley Podcast. Today, Jonathan Sheffield returns to the channel to talk about the authenticity of the book of Daniel. So Jonathan argues that Daniel is authentic, which is contrary to the position of most scholars that it is not authentic, and it is a 2nd century BCE text. But Jonathan here dates it much earlier. Before we get started, I do want to, to say publicly here, thank you to Jonathan for creating the new intro to History Valley. The, the new intro that everybody's been seeing for a, for a little bit now was created by Jonathan. So I just wanted to say that real quick. Um, but yeah, take us, uh, take us away, Jonathan. Uh, why do you think the book of Daniel is authentic? Well, uh, thanks for having me on your show again, uh, uh, Jacob. Course. Really, uh, really appreciate it. Um, you know, when we look at the book of Daniel, uh, I think there are a number of elements that we have to look to in ascertaining the, the date of this particular book. Uh, I, I think one of the things uh, that I look at initially that stands out uh, in reference to the book of Daniel is the fact that outside of Porphyry of Tyre, there is no historical reference uh, in the period, especially in the second century BC, of a work of that magnitude uh, coming into production, uh, being distributed throughout the uh, Jewish communities uh, that recognizes any type of publication that comes in. Uh, so for me, I think I initially have to become a little bit skeptical of the idea that uh, it's a byproduct of the second century uh, BC. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we understand uh, the war that was going on uh, between uh, the Jews and uh, uh, the Secludians. Uh, so uh, most people were running off. Uh, we also have writings of the uh, or the exploits of the Maccabean family. So we know the, the high priestly uh, class that uh, um, played a big part during this particular period in time. And there's nothing in their writings that indicate uh, that any work came into production, which would have had to probably uh, be authorized under their priestly line to actually get into the synagogues. So outside of Porphyry, and uh, the interesting part about this is uh, one of the common attacks that they use uh, against the book of Daniel is, um, you know, in the book of Daniel, um, there's really no historical reference to some of the figures and characters that it's uh, portraying. And as a result, you know, we have to question its historicity. Well, uh, that argument actually goes both sides. So first and foremost, we, even though we have writings of the period, and there's a number of writings that do come out of the period, we have no historical reference in the second century BC to a work of this magnitude or any other, uh, not only uh, being produced, but uh, finding its way into the Orthodox Jewish canon. Hmm. So, so you do, uh, so you don't think that Daniel, the book of Daniel mentions, or in some sort of coded fashion mentions uh, Antiochus, because a lot of people say, well, it mentions this particular Antiochus in the second century BCE, and it describes well, his reign. Well, I, I think, uh, I, I think there is a reference. Uh, I think when we do look at the book of Daniel, um, it's, it, it does seem pretty clear uh, as portraying uh, Antiochus as the sort of archetype or uh, type of the Antichrist coming into the uh, kind of holy of holies and, uh, you know, really uh, uh, offering that sacrilege. So in, in terms of what Daniel is making the prediction, as uh, many people believe, I would say yes. I, I, I think it is clear that that event is referenced. Um, but in terms of historical reference, in terms of an actual publication, because I, I know the argument goes that uh, it seems like Daniel was very bad on history up until the time of Antiochus. 
And uh, there, it just seems very consistent. Um, and that's why we must take the position that, well, it's probably more likely that uh, an author wrote it at that particular time than uh, previous to that. But uh, what we would expect to see is some sort of indication or trace evidence of a work of that magnitude coming into the Jewish community. And there is just no information. Um, once again, we, we know the, the, the Maccabean line, uh, we know the high priests uh, that would have had the power to bring this work into production, but uh, we do not uh, actually see any, any data from any of the writings of the period that indicate such a work did come into being. So that's, th that's one of the things that I look at. So when would you date Daniel then? Yeah, so I, I would place it um, in uh, 6th century uh, BC. I think uh, there, there's a couple of uh, other things that we have to look at in terms of looking at the Jewish uh, writings or their canon as a whole. Uh, I think one of the things that we see in history is uh, when we're looking at the Orthodox Jewish canon or their their book of 24, or as the Protestants look at the, the book of 39, we have all these works uh, in the Hellenistic uh, period that came into being, uh, the book of Maccabees, uh, Ben Syriac, um, other editions of Daniel. And what we notice about these works is that there's a number of them. They find their way into the Septuagint, uh, they're all over the ancient world. If we look at the, the various uh, Septuagint editions, uh, these works are all over the place. Uh, where we don't find them is actually in the Orthodox Jewish canon. Um, and, it, and if you think about it, uh, one of the questions that I did raise to John J. Collins uh, during my uh, discussion with him is... While we definitely understand that uh, the book of the Maccabees, which held tremendous value for mm. the uh, Jewish people uh, with the celebration of Hanukkah, uh, it's, it's throughout their liturgy. It represents one of the greatest military battles since the time of David. Uh, while that work uh, is celebrated uh, every year at Hanukkah, it's part of the Jewish liturgy. It's part of their history. Uh, it doesn't become part of their canon. And we do have to ask a work like Daniel, which would have been interpreted as a sort of interpreter of dreams, uh, which the Jews later in time actually uh, brought it over and classified it under the writings. Uh, why would the book of Daniel get into the Orthodox Jewish canon and uh, the Book of Maccabees uh, would not. Um, and one of the things that we can explain is, and this does come from the writing of Josephus, is that the Jewish canon was closed after the time of R.C. Xerxes. And he does go mm -hmm. into a discussion that shows that by the time of R.C. Xerxes, uh, all the prophets have been written, they had their writings, uh, they had their Torah. And part of his proofs to say, well, look out in history and what we can see from the time of R.C. Xerxes. You had all these other Jewish writings, but none of them get in, which would explain why uh, the Book of Maccabees, while as the Jewish people, uh, why it doesn't get into their canon. Whereas a Book of Daniel, if it would have been part of that period, uh, why that would get in and Maccabees doesn't. So that's another thing that we have to look at. So I, I would classify as a, another interesting observation of history. Um, Daniel, if it's true that it uh, was a byproduct of the second century BC, uh, as well as uh, the Maccabees, why does that uh, command uh, reverence in the Jewish canon, Orthodox Jewish canon, but the book of Maccabees does not? Um, what would explain that fact or a simple explanation is um, it was written at the time it said it was. So you think that 
it was prophesying the reign of Antiochus, or do you think it's possible that aspect of it could have been inserted later by a redactor? Uh, well, I, 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 so, so here's the problem with the, the redactor uh, theory, and uh, I've, I've kind of mentioned it uh, probably in my most recent debate on the book of Isaiah. Now, uh, if, if we look at the Jews, the Jews were very spread out. They were in Egypt. Uh, you know, many stayed in Babylon. They didn't uh, come back to uh, Jerusalem after the exile. They were in Yemen, uh, Egypt. Uh, they were all over the known world. Uh, if someone was to redact or add these sections in at a later particular time, how do you uh, create the uniformity that we see uh, throughout the Jewish synagogues uh, in all known parts of the world? And I think uh, Rabbi Solomon, who was a, a Jewish sage and scholar, actually responding to... Um, uh, a Muslim scholar uh, during the Middle Ages makes this very point against uh, the Muslim scholars' claims that uh, after uh, after the destruction of the first temple, you know, there there was all this redaction or there was this attempt to create a new edition. Uh, and one of the points Rabbi Solomon makes is the fact that, well, we would expect to see some sort of trace evidence somewhere in the Jewish communities as a whole or independently because uh, we did have many different factions of Judaism that did not go along. Uh, but what we see is a unified text. I mean, they have a uh, different uh, oral uh, tradition as we see in the Babylonian and Palestinian Talmud. They have two different uh, oral uh, traditions there, but both of those groups who subscribe to those uh, uh, different texts, they only support one Daniel, and they all come up with uh, the same particular date uh, as Daniel's placing him back. So um, if that was the case, why don't we see the type of evidence that we see? I, I mean, if we look at the Septuagint, uh, we see many different uh, additions being added to the Old Testament canon. But what we see in the Greek tradition, we do not see in the Orthodox Jewish canon of a diverse uh, manuscript tradition where, okay, someone would have added it, but how did they get that addition into uh, the Jewish communities in Babylon or Yemen or Egypt or wherever else they were dispersed unless they sort of had a unified council where they set this is what the canon was going to be. We just don't see no evidence of that in history. Uh, they don't have any Council of Rome in 382 or Council of Carthage in 419. Uh, there is no element where the Jews all came together to sort of standardize the central text for its community. So I take it since you were mentioning earlier Artaxerxes, that by the time that Artaxerxes was doing his thing, that um, the decisions must have been made, like in the prophets were written then by that time, all finished by that time. Does this involve Ezra and him bringing a, a copy of the Torah to the Jews as commanded by one of the Artaxerxes? Well, I, you know, uh, we, we had a great number of uh, sages during the period. So, but it, it's right around that time. So if you place mm -hmm. it uh, no later than 400 BC, um, which, or 424, uh, right at the time of R.C. Xerxes, the canon was already closed. Now, uh, I know in Josephus uh, Contra Atrium, he specifically states, okay, well, the uh, the prophets wrote in their own time uh, and, you know, the canon was closed. And, you know, an interesting thing that we see in the Tanonic literature is this idea that uh, the prophecy has ceased. You know, there was uh, no longer, um, you know, prophecy being revealed from heaven to the Jews. And it's all over the Tanatic literature that we see that uh, we see the Jews not, uh, you know, say, hey, uh, God has basically stopped speaking, which is a weird thing for them to do, say, okay, well, God has become silent with us. Um, and as a result, the prophecy has ceased with the last uh, prophets of uh, Malachi, Zechariah, uh, and that group. Um, now, while they still understood the use of the divine voice, 
uh, they said prophecy uh, had ceased. So adding anything to the canon uh, in that period would have been considered blasphemy for the Jews to do. So um, it would have been it would have resulted in some sort of commotion among the Jewish people, just like you see a, a number of debates uh, within the Pharisees camps. Uh, over the washing of hands between the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai. We don't see any type of response to literature going out that there was a group that was trying to promulgate the book of Daniel into the synagogues by adding maybe these additional sections that occurred during uh, the time of Antiochus. So do you think it's possible that the Daniel, that, that Daniel isn't, wasn't even talking about Antiochus at all, that it could, it could be someone else? Uh, well, it, it seems very clear that it, it's some sort of archetype, um, which would seem to fit uh, that particular period. But, you know, once again, we are dealing with uh, interpretation, uh, you know, even when it comes down to the, uh, the four beasts, you know, what do they represent? Now, I, I mm -hmm. think uh, one of our earliest... Uh, uh, claims against it uh, is obviously coming from Porphyry Tyre. And he does make the claim that, uh, well, the history is good up until Ant uh, Antiochus. Um, he was one of the ones that, uh, or uh, the sole argument that came out against the book of Daniel, because obviously he understood what it meant to his Platonic worldview. Uh, so it, it was an area of attack that Jerome actually uh, responded to. But mm. uh, but there is a possibility, the interpretation, you know, not everyone identifies Rome with uh, the last beast. Uh, so uh, the 70 weeks can be uh, understood uh, in a uh, different way. So the interpretive value, I think from my standpoint, I, I think there is some consistency there with uh, understanding the period of Antiochus, the sacrilege that comes into the temple. Um, I would say there is some consistency on that point, uh, which then allows us to ask the question, um, is this a black swan to the naturalistic interpretation of history? Do we got to start investigating deeper into this question? So because um, that uh, in the late first millennium BCE, when we get after 400 uh, BCE, um, anything, anyone trying to include something into the canon of the Hebrew Bible, because that would have been blasphemy. Um, when you made that point to, uh, I'm assuming you made that point to John J. Collins. Yes, I, um, I, I did. How did he respond well, uh, John J. Collins, and he understood it was a really good question because uh, obviously as a Roman Catholic, they do accept uh, the Maccabees and uh, they're trying to understand, well, uh, the work of the Maccabees, uh, even if we look at Second Maccabees, the prayers for the dead, there's nothing from a standpoint uh, that would keep it out of the Jewish uh, tradition, even if uh, there was a sort of Christian response. Okay, well, the Christians are using it. Let's not use it. Let's separate it. But uh, the, the doctrine uh, would support their prayers for the dead. Uh, now, John J. Collins uh, tried to frame the discussion. Well, if the Jews would have added it to the canon, it would have looked at they were sort of mocking uh, the Greeks at that particular time uh, by adding it uh, to their canon. Uh, because you're, you're basically commemorating uh, your destruction over uh, the Secludian Empire, which uh, was a descendant from the Macedonian line. So um, he looked at it as, well, they wouldn't have done it for that reason. Well, they did commemorate the holiday every year. They set it as a law. So whether they add it to the canon or not, they did add it as part of their formal liturgy in the Jewish church. So if you think about it, they're mocking them every year at the holiday. Um, it's it, it's all over uh, their tradition. So uh, if if they're putting it into the um, 
not only into the Jewish scroll of fasting, but it's in the in the Jewish liturgy. It's an official holiday, uh, which they were designed to commemorate this epic defeat. Well, they're mocking them uh, in that regard. So why would they prevent them from putting it into the canon? So uh, that's where uh, um, John J. Collins doesn't seem very con- it, it doesn't seem consistent with his argument. Uh, because if if that was correct, then what what we see there is um, they're mocking them throughout in the Jewish scroll of fasting, uh, in the celebration of, of Hanukkah every year. They made an official law, uh, and this was done under the Maccabean line, uh, where uh, they called for an observance every year. I know Josephus goes into a pretty uh detailed description of this and how it's celebrated and how it came into being so um that didn't seem as consistent now obviously i i brought up uh several points there's no historical reference in the period indicating any such publication uh came at that time uh secondly you know the the jewish canon was closed and we can make an empirical observation from history all these books are published uh, during the Hellenistic period that do not find its way into the Orthodox Jewish canon. So what made uh, the book of Daniel supersede a work like the Maccabees that doesn't get in? But I, oh, go ahead. No, I didn't mean. To, uh, no, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought. Oh, yeah, no worries. Uh, but one of my biggest points in the thesis uh, that I make is. Um, is the fact that we do have a a public record where the book of Daniel came into public notice before this period. Um, And I know a lot of people have either chimed in or tried to, uh, you know, um, either criticize this analysis. But what what I do with this piece is, first, we have a report uh from josephus uh that the book of daniel was presented to the macedonian king alexander now first and foremost uh it is a report it's a report that was published to the greek and roman speaking world um at a time when the uh the syrian empire or many of the the family and descendants of the secludian empire was still there uh, the Greeks were still a dominant force. They were all over society. Here's a uh, here's a quick question. Uh, just to be thorough, you are talking just for the audience to, to, to see clearly. You are talking about Alexander the Great, right? Yes, Alexander the Great. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in uh, uh, 332 BC, specifically. Uh, during his campaign in that area, obviously going down uh, the uh, the coastline there between Byblos, uh, Sidon, and then making its way to Tyre. Uh, we have mm-hmm. from the history, he went over to uh, Gaza. So, so in other words, we would have to claim that Josephus was, I guess, lying about that if Daniel was written in the second century BCE. Yeah, well, uh, it's... It's not only the lying, because we could say, okay, well, you know, maybe uh, Josephus was trying to spread propaganda. Now, first, you're doing that to, he's writing specifically the antiquities to uh, the Greek and Roman speaking world. So it's odd, or as I framed it to John J. Collins, is this uh, Sherlock Holmes, the dog that didn't bark? Uh, because of the fact that uh, there is no response from the Greek world on this issue. But I, I think even bigger than the idea that, uh, you know, none of the ancient historians who came after Josephus um, criticized him for this point. Uh, one of the things that we have to look at is uh, Jerusalem was not taken during this period. Uh, which is kind of odd if you think about it, because uh, his one of his top uh, generals, uh, Ptolemy, uh, did take Jerusalem after the death of uh, Alexander. Three years after the death of Alexander, 
uh, he does take Jerusalem, which then begs the question, uh, why is there such a big difference in the military minds of these two great commanders, uh, one being Alexander the Great and one being uh, Ptolemy? Why did he feel the need to take Jerusalem uh, and send uh, a number of its inhabitants down to Egypt as, uh, as slaves? So um, it, it is interesting because if you look at the, the history of Jerusalem, it is basically attacked uh, by every uh, ancient civilization, um, you know, going back to the Assyrians who uh, tried to attack it, uh, but somehow failed in their attempt. Uh, the Babylonians did take it. Uh, but under the administrations of Alexander and Cyrus the Great, they did not. Uh, obviously, under uh, uh, Cyrus the Great, it prospered. He uh, returned the Jews uh, from exile, uh, he funded their campaign to rebuild Jerusalem. And Alexander, uh, which if at some of the documentation at the time, uh, J Jerusalem and the state of Judea was huge. Uh, Hecatius of Adera tells us the state of Judea around that time. It's a wealth. There's all these uh, towns and cities. And if you think about it, uh, what's happening with uh, Alexander the Great and Tyre? Well, he's launching a big campaign against them. He needs resources. And the interesting thing is, while Josephus provides us the only specific account of Alexander uh, being shown the book of Daniel, if we start to understand the concept, there was a request from Alexander the Great in additional works from uh, origin uh we we see this in josephus as well of alexander requesting from the high priest uh troops and resources for his men who was at tyre now similarly uh what we see is a denial of the request and, and i think when we start to look at the context that the jews were persian allies um the Tyre made the same type of response to Alexander the Great at his request because they were like, hey, the war's not over yet. Uh, yeah, you defeated Darius's army in the west, but he's building a bigger army in the east. Does it make sense for us to go ahead and side with you when the war hasn't been over? So if you think about it, it opens up the mind of what the Persian uh, allies thought process was. Yeah, they're situated in the west, but uh, Darius is making a bigger armor in the east. No one thought Alexander the Great would beat, you know, a hundred thousand man army with forty thousand troops. Uh, it was just too early to tell. So that request coming from Alexander to the high priest of the Jews makes sense. The circumstantial evidence would support that, um, and we do have a lot of testimony. Uh, from the Jewish records that support not only the request, uh, but uh, Alexander was in the area. And I, I think more importantly on that point is we do find an area that uh, Alexander uh, the Great and uh, Palestine or Judea uh, did come to terms. So even in the, in the pagan histories of Arian, Arian does mention that uh, the Jews or uh, the people in Palestine, which would have been Jerusalem in that area, did come to arrangements uh, with the Jews. Uh, and this is after the fact where uh, there are reports that request was asked uh, by Alexander from the Jews. So when we start looking at the context of it, uh, the Jews were in a position where they were asked by Alexander. He turned down. They turned down the request reportedly but somehow got to have all these benefit uh afterwards and what explains all those benefits well you know alexander who was uh uh did like to adopt foreign gods a, a god who predicted your victories you did not want to uh mess with and alexander who was uh you know uh, someone that didn't look to the gods 
he would now naturally want to rally that God to his uh, uh, cause. And someone that predicted his victories, he would want on his side. So I, I, I think it, it, it provides probably one of the best cases to explain why Jerusalem wasn't taken. And then after he dies, Ptolemy can care less. Uh, you know, obviously there was something that upset him during that time that now when he was his own king, he decided to take Jerusalem. Well, wouldn't that have been the advice uh, that Alex or Ptolemy would have gave at that time? So what was the decision process uh, that led Alexander to not only spare it, but give the Jews all this benefit during that time? Have you been able to talk with other uh, scholars that agree that Daniel appears to be earlier? What, what is your experience in that? Oh, well, the Jewish scholars do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, the, the Jewish scholars uh, do support that thesis, um, you know, and, and do make those claims. Uh, I, I think modern uh, academia does not. I, I think in my discussions with uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Carrier on this issue, uh, Dr. Joshua Bowen, uh, obviously uh, Dr. John J. Collins, uh, representing the academic or secular academic uh, academy in this field, uh, they would say no. Uh, but in saying no, um, how do they defend that thesis? Now, most of their argument is a literary argument that they're making for the book of Daniel. They have no historical reference uh, to explain the creation and distribution of the book of Daniel throughout the, the synagogue. They can't explain why uh, a subline work like the Book of Daniel that would have been viewed as a sage interpreting uh, dreams would command uh, its entry into the ca uh, canon over a book like uh, the, the Book of Maccabees. This idea that after R.C. Xerxes, uh, they said the canon was closed because the spirit, had, the spirit of prophecy has already ceased. And then we have, you know, one of the biggest things is without the book of Daniel, how do we explain that uh, Jerusalem was from Alexander? Given the historical data that we get from Origen, Eusebius, uh, the scroll of Fasten, the Talmud, uh, and Josephus on this issue, there's we have multiple attestation in independent sources of Jewish documentation that Alexander did va um, visit the area. Um, and we have a lot of circumstantial evidence that would support this case. Uh, so, you know, from my standpoint, other than a naturalistic worldview that says prophecy can't happen, what is their underlying foundation outside of their literary analysis that can go both ways? Uh, to show that Daniel is a byproduct of the second century BC. Yeah, that's uh, that, that is definitely very fascinating. Um, I think I'll just say it did always bother me when I've been looking into Daniel for many years. It always bothered me, at least when I when I look at it. There's not a really, at least so far that I've seen, there is not a really clear cut reference to Antiochus. I don't think we can claim certainty that Daniel was ever talking about Antiochus. Uh, that's something that's, uh, that's something that's bothered me. And when I try to look, you're like, okay, well, Daniel got everything right, but screwed up his death. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that, that, when I when I when I hear that, that's bothered me. Uh, uh, that's really that's really it there. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I you know uh, once again there is some interpretation uh, into those passages, and uh, you know I'm the first to admit that uh, different uh, fathers in the ancient world uh, obviously had a. A uh, different view on it. Obviously, Josephus understood it to be Antiochus. Um, you know, Jerome does a commentary. Origin, 
Uh, but there is different views on how the book of Daniel is to be interpreted, and we do see those differences. Now, there is some consistency. I think most fathers understood uh, Rome being uh, the final beast. Uh, but, you know, once again, um, you know, interpretations aside, um, and, you know, going to your point, yeah, he got everything right except his death. Uh, which someone from the period you would expect to, to have known that. Um, yeah, I would think so. Um, you, you know, it's like, okay, well, are they trying to throw somebody off if they're trying to put it forward as a book of prophecy? Because that's what they're uh, spinning. Uh, they would want to get that detail right. Uh, so uh, if the aim is to put one over on uh, uh, outside the... Uh, uh, the Jewish establishment to the Greek speaking world that we have prophesied this. Well, uh, it, 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 it really doesn't give a lot of credibility to your case, especially if you start uh, getting things wrong. And the most powerful uh, characters in the story, like the kings, like Nebuchadnezzar, yes. Belshazzar, Cyrus, Darius, um, to which I think uh, I think uh, is more evidence for your point because I'm like okay, um, it seems like it's centralizing the theme around yes. these kings, and where's Antiochus? Yeah, and, and I think that's uh, and, and, and that's a valid point, um, you know. And I think you know one of the points I brought up with Collins is what, what we see in this genre of Jewish literature here is one of the first times that uh, it's it's giving meaning uh, to history. Uh, I think what you know previously what we've seen in the ancient civilizations is uh, the kind of nirvana effect or history just repeats itself. There's no really meaning to it. Uh, and the Greeks had that understanding of this cyclic process. Uh, but in the book of Daniel, and it, it one of the things John J. Collins and I discussed is we see this sort of evolutionary idea that uh, with uh, Daniel interpreting uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, first time we give meaning to history um, at the holistic or the, the macro view uh, when we're looking at history, that history has meaning. There's a specific design to it. Uh, whereas in the ancient civilizations, you don't see this sort of uh, thought or an idea coming out of this design to history. And we only see that coming out at the macro level in the book of Daniel, uh, which is pretty fascinating because it's giving uh, sort of design and meaning to history mm -hmm. that we don't see in any other history, in any other uh, civilization. And we, we see this with the book of Daniel coming out. Uh, so it, it, it's kind of odd that uh, of all these great ancient societies, uh, it's actually coming out of the Jewish literature, this idea for the design for history. I've, um, I've often made the point on this channel that most of, for, the, for the majority of the time, I mean, not of the time, I, I should put it like this, um, for the most part, um, I agree with, uh, academics on uh, dating the dating of the Old Testament, but what I never really talked about is Daniel. I kind of just uh, I didn't talk about the dating of Daniel too much. But when I looked into it, um, Dan the dating of Daniel always bothered me. It didn't seem very. It didn't seem as solid from from my reading of it. From yeah, it, it, and even if you look at the structure of the book, um, you know, and, and I know in our discussions with Carrier on this particular subject, you know, if, if you look at the very composition of the book, you know, what does it begin with? It, it begins with, uh, you know, um, you know, the Hebrew, you know, Daniel's coming into uh, part of uh, that family line. He's going to begin with Hebrew. Uh, he goes to the court, and all of a sudden, you see the imperial Aramaic uh, coming in, uh, you know, with the Babylonians. And then it goes back uh, to Hebrew, 
which is a strange compilation for an author to do. Uh, and even if we look at uh, Ben Syriac, uh, what we see in that composition uh, was it was a publication in Hebrew originally. And then uh, his grandson, uh, Ben uh, Syriac, uh, translated to Greek. He only did it in one language. Uh, uh, here yeah. it goes uh, back and forth. And so uh, we still have to understand what, what best explains that fact. Uh, is it some random author uh, that, uh, apart from the high priest of the Maccabean line, who would have been able to orchestrate and possibly get it into uh, the, the Jewish synagogues throughout the, or even though it would have been a very tough case for them, uh, the composition is tough. Uh, why would you produce a document that way? Now, if you're Daniel and uh, you're beginning off, in your humble origins and exile, yeah, you're going to start off your your journey uh, in the Hebrew language. You get to the court, uh, the language changed because what are you doing? You're interacting uh, with the Babylonians, and then after the Persians come in, what what happens? They have a different language, so you go back to your own. Uh, so that always, uh, when when you looked at the composition of Daniel, what best explains that fact? Some uh, unknown author running around the second century BC thought, Hey, uh, I'm going to change up uh, the composition of this. I'm going to begin with Hebrew, change it. And then uh, when the Persians come in and take over, I'm going to go back to my original language. So that always <laughs> struck me as odd too. When you look at the composition of the book of Daniel, too much is given to some of the literary analysis, but look at the literary composition. That would fit someone going through that stage when the Persians come in, obviously a different language. Uh, let's go back to uh, my original language. Hmm. Well, thanks for joining me today. This has been a very fascinating uh, conversation. And I think at some point we should have a part two to this. Oh, definitely. I, I think there's uh, one way or another. The book of Daniel is fascinating, uh, I think, from just a, a number of expert, uh, um, different ways, but, uh, it's always been interested to me. I felt like there was a need to argue other points than, uh, have been argued in the past in defending the book of Daniel. I thought taking more historical analysis, uh, as opposed to a primary, uh, literary dependent argumentation for the book. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.